So last week, um, I was gone for an entire week. I was in Poland. Um, and uh, I was at the Catholic University of Lublin. Um, very many famous people graduated there. The most famous being John Paul II. The second most famous being Nick's mom. Um, so um, I was presenting a paper on philosophy. Um, because it's, uh, I took a philosophy course in college on uh, St. Augustine. And for seven years, I've been wrestling with this one section of Augustine's Confessions and figuring out what it means. Um, and so I finally got this paper published. Um, and I'm going to, it's going to be published in a journal I got presented at this conference. But I also got to tour Poland a bit. Um, so I'll just speak very briefly about some of the things I saw. Um, I saw the Divine Mercy image. Um, where, where the Sister Faustina uh, had this vision of Jesus um, encouraging her to pray the Divine Mercy Chaplet. I also saw the uh, cassock of John Paul II uh, that he was wearing when he was shot. So you can see down here, I'll turn off the lights, but uh, there were blood stains on the cassock. Um, the person who shot him, uh, John Paul II, later visited and forgave and gave the sacraments to. So it was pretty moving seeing that cassock and and seeing the blood on the cassock and realized that he forgave the person who did that to him. I also went down below Krakow into the salt mines uh, where people had carved chapels um, so that they could go to Mass on Sunday as they were working in the mines. Uh, this was a, a monument to the Warsaw Uprising in 1944 uh, where they tried to overthrow Hitler. Uh, unfortunately, they were all caught and executed. Uh, but the cathedral here is a military memorial. Um, so all the, all the Polish soldiers, uh, their, their monuments are inside that cathedral. And this is from Auschwitz, where uh, St. Maximilian Kolbe, this is the cell where St. Maximilian Kolbe was locked and he was starved uh, at the concentration camp. But, uh, but he didn't die because his faith was so strong. I also saw his death certificate when they, when they ultimately did give him a lethal injection. Uh, but here's also an image of the Sacred Heart that uh, was carved in one of the cells in Auschwitz. Uh, the concentration camp. So uh, one thing I, I gained from, from going to Poland was just a, a really, real sense of God's mercy. Um, all, all of these pictures in, in some way represent God's mercy. So I'd, I'd like to start uh, the talk just by uh, saying the prayer all together um, that's on the board. So if we could all say that together. We don't have to stand up, but we'll all say it. In the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. O oh God, in whom mercy is endless, and the treasure of compassion inexhaustible, look kindly upon us, and increase thy mercy in us, that in difficult moments we might not despair, nor become despondent, but with great confidence submit ourselves to your most holy will, which is love and mercy itself. Amen. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Um... So, um, we're just going to start out. You might think, well, why am I talking about this philosophy paper I gave and not my trip to Poland, where I got to eat all sorts of cool foods and see all sorts of cool sights. Um, but St. Augustine, I, I gave the paper on St. Augustine, and St. Augustine has this to say about traveling the world. Um, does anybody want to read the quote? Yes, Anna. People travel to wander at mountain peaks, and the huge waves of the sea, at wide waterfalls, on rivers, in the border of the ocean, at the gyrations of the stars, but in doing so, they leave behind their very selves, and do not marvel at the great mystery that is within them. Very good, Anna. Um, so, well, what, what do we think this means? There's, there's wonders in the, in the mountains and in the sea, uh, but the greatest mystery is within our own souls. And St. Augustine um, tried to study this mystery of what's in our own souls, and he tried to uh, understand it as best he could. Um, and his, his, uh, his confessions is basically his autobiography of his life. He wrote it right after he converted to Catholicism, and he'd become a bishop. Um, and he was trying to understand his own soul, and I try to understand the human souls, because he was put in charge of, of leading people's souls to heaven. Um, so, he, he was really trying to wrestle with a lot of problems um, related to the way the soul works. 
Um, so the, the first problem, the main problem that he keeps coming back to in the Confessions is what I'm going to call Mino's Paradox. Um, and the way Mino's Paradox works is this. Raph, I've lost something. Can you help me find it? Sure. Why aren't you helping me find it? What? You should be helping me find it. I asked you to help me find it. Why aren't you helping me find it? You, you don't know what I'm looking for, right? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you, you, if you want to search for something, you can't search for something unless you know what it is you're looking for, right? If I just walked up to you, I put you on the spot there, but if I just walk up to you and I'm like, Raph, help me find something. If you don't know what it is I'm looking for, you, you can't really help me find it. Um, so St. Augustine presents this in two ways. The first way he presents it is a lost coin. Um, so if you lose a coin, what do you have to do if you're going to, what do you have to know about the coin if you're going to find the coin? What it looks like. Yeah, what it looks like. Is it a penny, a nickel, or a dime? Um, and then he goes on and he talks about another example, forgetting someone's name. Now this is kind of weird. If you've forgotten someone's name, you actually have to know their name. Right? Yeah. <laughs> do we see how that's true? Right? If, if, if you actually have no recollection of ever knowing their name, right, can you, can you even know you've forgotten it? Right? So in order to know you've forgotten someone's name, you actually have to remember that you knew their name at one point. Um, so this is called Mino's Paradox. We can't know what we're, we can't search for something unless we know what we're searching for. But let's think about searching for truth. How can you, or for happiness, how can we search for happiness if we don't know what it is we're looking for, Pat? You, like, try different things. you try different things, right? But how do you know you want to be happy if you've never been happy? Because you see, like, other people being happy. But how do you know that happiness is something you want? Yeah, you, you don't. But yeah, you, you kind of see other people being happy. You try some different things. But even before you know what it is that's going to make you happy, you still want to be happy, right? Even if you don't know what it is that would make you personally happy. Anna? Well, I feel like everyone's been happy at one point. Everyone's been happy at one point. Yeah. Like, you're four years old. You're, you're four years old. Like, unhappy. Okay. So when you're four years old, what, what, what were you happy about when you were four years old? Dad just snagged me a candy bar. Oh, wow. Okay, so you're looking forward to one of Augustine's solutions to the problem, so that's awesome. Uh, you have the benefit of living after St. Augustine. Before St. Augustine, people were really puzzled by this. Um, truth is something else that we... Um, how do you know when you found the truth if you don't already know the truth? You see the problem? Somebody tells you, this is true, well, how do you know if you don't already know the truth? But if you already know it, why do you have to search for it? Do we see how this is kind of confusing yes. and paradoxical? Mr. Dwyer. Well, confusion is a happiness um, and pleasure are mixed up, hmm. are conflated. Okay. And pleasure only lasts as long as the activity that produces it. Matt Kelly. Anyway. Sure, so yes, and that's... You have to, you have to know... Yeah. You know pleasure, you're talking about something deeper. Exactly, and that's, that's kind of... Um, we'll, we'll get to that point later, too, that, um, you know, maybe, maybe when you're four, Anna, you, and you, you know, get the candy bar, right? But that pleasure goes away, so is that really happiness? Um, that's a question we'll come back to later. But, um, all right. So the first person to think about this paradox was named Plato. Uh, he lived in the 500s BC. Um, but a lot of people have studied it since Plato. The last person is named Gareth Matthews. I believe he's a philosophy professor at University of Kentucky, if I remember correctly. Um, he breaks the paradox into two parts. The first problem is the targeting problem. How can we know to search for something we've never experienced? Remember, so if, if you're searching for somebody's name, if you're trying to remember somebody's name, right, you have to know that you knew it at one point, right? So you have to have known the truth at one point if you're going to search for it. 
And then we have the recognition problem. We don't know we've found something if we don't have any prior knowledge of, it, of what it is. Remember that question of knowing the truth. Well, how can you recognize the truth if you don't already know it? But if you already know it, then you shouldn't have to search for it, right? So these are two problems, and they've plagued philosophers since Plato first posed the problem in the 500s BC. Are we ready to hear how Plato answered it? Okay? It's really weird. Um, but it kind of makes sense when you think about it. Plato's answer was called the theory of recollection. So, he said before we were born, our souls inhabited this realm without a body. And they knew all truth. And they were with the gods. And they communed with the gods and they knew all truth and they didn't have a body. All right? Then we got the body and we forgot everything. So we've got to somehow remember what we knew before we were born. What do we think about that? Wait, can you say it one more time? Okay, so before we were born, we were just this disembodied soul, right? And we knew all truth. We knew everything. We were happy. And then we fell down and we got caught in a body. And so if we're going to know truth and we're going to be happy, we have to remember what we knew before birth. Do we see how that kind of solves the problem? We knew the truth at one point, but we've forgotten it. We've been happy at one point, but we've forgotten it. And we've got to remember what it was that made us happy. Do we see how that's kind of an answer to the problem? What do we think about that, though? Do we believe that? For a while, a lot of Christians believed that. Um, a lot of Christians. The most famous was named Origen. He thought that this philosopher Plato was actually a prophet of Jesus. Um, and he believed in reincarnation. He thought before we were born, we were all in heaven, and the purpose of life is to get back to heaven. Um, uh, but because the body is distracting us from heaven, he thought he had to not eat anything. He had to not pay attention to his body at all. Um, and he actually ended up castrating himself. Do we all know what that is? Yes. No? Um, it means chopping off something um, that's very painful. Um, so, uh, Origen did that, and he thought that was what was going to help him contemplate God more. See, when Greek philosophers have bad ideas, it always leads to death or dismemberment. I've talked about the dismemberment. Let's talk about the death. The other guy was named Manny. He, he was part of this weird Christian sect um, Manny believed that the God who wrote the Old Testament was an evil God, and Jesus is the good God. And God the Father and God the Son are at war with each other. Jesus created the Spirit, God the Father created the body, and the perfect soul is going to liberate his soul from his body. But most of us can't liberate our souls from our body. So we've got to go around and find a wise sage who eats turnips in the desert. And the wise sage who eats turnips in the desert is going to, um, you know, make us better in this life. And then when we die, we get reincarnated as, what do you think? Turnip. Yeah, a wise sage who eats turnips in the desert. Wow. Yeah, so he's eating all his turnips. Turnips make you burp, apparently. Miss Joey. Why do you call them Christianized if they reject the body? Um, they still believe in Jesus even if they have very weird ideas about this. There, there would be a heretical sect, certainly. Um, they would be heretics, but they would be Christians. Um, so that, but when you burp, according to Manny, your soul is actually being released from your body. And then, um, you, when your soul is released from your body, it ends up going to the moon, and then it has to be reincarnated again, and then it goes to the sun, and then it's in heaven. So that's like a smart guy. Well, Augustine thought he was a smart guy. Augustine followed him for a while. And he found some turnip-eating man who ate it, lived in the desert. Um, and he, he followed that for a while. And he kind of realized it was a little stupid. Um, because eating turnips is a little dumb. You know, doesn't actually bring you closer to God. So he converted to Catholicism. St. Augustine did. But he converted to Catholicism because he read Plato. And he realized that 
Manny didn't really get Plato right. Um, so he, he, he believed in Catholicism, but he also loved the teachings of Plato. But unlike Origen, he didn't want to chop anything off to be Christian and Platonist and follow Plato. So he has to find some other way of resolving Nino's paradox that doesn't involve reincarnation and recollection. Anna. Um, so did Origen die because of the, that thing that happened? Uh, he didn't. Oh, did Manny die from um, in the ocean? The I, I believe Manny ate too many turnips. Um, yes. Right. Oh. Um, I believe that is how Manny died. Um, so, Augustine's got to come up with some other answer to this problem. Okay? So, when Augustine's writing his autobiography, he's just become bishop. And he says, I'm a Christian, I also like Plato, but I'm not one of these crazy people, right? I'm not Manny, I'm not Origen. So, he's got to come up with his own answer to this paradox. And so this is, this is how he introduces the paradox. He's, he, when he's talking, Plato was talking about searching for truth. How can we search for truth? For Augustine, the question is, how can we search for God? And as the quote here says, How do I seek you, Lord? For when I seek you, my God, I seek a happy life. So Augustine starts out by wondering how he can search for God, but now he's changed it. How can I search for a happy life? Why do you think he changes his focus that way? He thinks he'll be happy if he finds God. So he can, he can, he's legitimately doing that. Yeah. But how has he improved the problem a bit? Because everybody wants a happy life, basically. Everybody wants a happy life. He says that in this quote. Is it not the happy life that everyone wants? Can it be that anyone does not want it? It's clear we all want to be happy, right? Is it clear we all want God? Not no. So, if he can answer the question with regard to a happy life and show how a happy life leads to God, he can show how somebody, you know, any old atheist off the street can, uh, can seek a happy life, right? But then that, an that leads to the same question we were describing before. Um, where have they known it that they would want it? Where have they seen it that they would love it? I wonder whether the happy life is in the memory, for we would not love it unless we knew it. So this is the same as what problem we talked about before. Mino's paradox, right? We can't know what we don't love. Okay? Or sorry, we can't love what we don't know. If we're going to seek after a happy life, we have to have some knowledge of what it is. Okay? Now, Anna, what did you say earlier? I've said a lot of stuff. About the four-year-old. Yeah, or you feel joy, right? Maybe joy isn't necessarily living a happy life, but you still feel joy. Mr. Dreyer was talking about that. You know, that, you know, feeling joy might not be the same as living a happy life. But we know what it is to experience joy. And we can seek a happy life because we seek after joy. When we're not feeling joy, we want to feel joy again. And that's how we can target this search for the happy life. And that's what Augustine is saying in this quote. Even if one pursues it this way and another pursues it that way, there is nevertheless one thing which all are striving to attain, namely to experience joy. And since joy is something which no one is able to say is outside of their memory, we can discover joy in our memory and thus understand joy to be signified when we hear the phrase happy life. Just like you said, Anna, People, everyone at some point in their life has experienced some level of joy. Whether that's just a baby, just being happy about life, or being at the beach with your boyfriend or girlfriend, or skydiving, or, or Legos. This person looks really excited about her Legos. Um, we, we all experience joy in different things, but we all want to experience joy. And, and when we say we're seeking a happy life, really we, we want a life that brings us joy. So this kind of works. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, really, it's really sort of um, intuitive, right? We all know what it is to experience joy, and when we say we're seeking a happy life, really what we mean is we, we, we want something that's going to bring us joy. But there's still a couple problems in this account. We need to kind of clarify what Augustine's saying here. 
there are there are two major problems. First off, Mr. Dwyer, you mentioned joy can't exactly be the same thing as a happy life. So this is one of my professors. Yeah. It doesn't last, right? Um, so we, we're not all living a happy life. All of us have experienced joy, but we don't all know what would give us an ultimate happy life. So, let's see, this will actually, it never does. Um, all right, so uh, Scott McDonald thinks that uh, Augustine must mean something different. He's a professor I had at Cornell. He's the one who first got me into this topic. Um, he says, Augustine cannot simply mean that people take the expressions joy and happy life to be synonymous, or even that those expressions, while not synonymous, refer precisely to the same thing. And that's because everyone's experienced joy, but we aren't all living a happy life, necessarily. Okay? The joys that people experience, McDonald says, must be a token of the happy life, in the sense that a ring might be given as a token of one's love. Alright, do we see that? So maybe... God wants to give us ultimate happiness, right? But the joys we experience are kind of like a pledge of that. They're kind of like giving you a ring to anticipate what, what the ultimate happy life is going to be. Okay? And um, uh, what McDonald says, the clever thing about this model is that it explains how one can search for something one's never encountered before. So we've never really lived a happy life. But we have these little tastes of what a happy life is going to be like. And when we're not, happy, we're not experiencing joy, we want to experience joy again. And that kind of leads us to seek out more joy and, and more joy. And uh, hopefully we end up with a full happy life. Make sense? Do you think this is going to work? Anna. Well, are you, like, is this, like, alluding to that you... Like, the happy life, what do you mean by that? Are you saying, like, that's, like, afterwards? Or are you saying, like, you can live a happy life right now? Well, the happy life would be sort of the ultimate fulfilling life. But, like, is that in heaven, or is that in this life? I think Augustine would probably say that it's only ultimately in heaven. Okay. Um, and then everything we experience in this life is kind of a foretaste of it. Okay. Even the kid in the candy store, it's kind of like a foretaste of heaven. Do we think that works, though? Yeah. Raft, or Andrico. If you could find joy in commonly believed like, evil things, like, like you could find joy in some, some other person's suffering. Sure. <laughs> but that wouldn't be a, like, a token to heaven, so that would work. Yeah, so there are evil things that some people experience joy in. Raph, you got something? I mean, you could just keep chasing the token and not actually go towards the actual source. Perfect. Both of those... I think are very legitimate concerns, right? Um, what happens, donuts bring us joy, right? You love it when people bring you donuts. What happens if you eat too many donuts? You get fat, or even in the short term, you just get sick, right? All right, relationships bring us joy, right? Sometimes, do they always last? No. Even when they do last, they only last as long as this life. But, you know, we've, we've all had the experience of thinking we found true love, and that doesn't end up happening. Um, and then there's dueling, things that do not bring joy at all, that we do anyway. Well, they do bring joy, otherwise we wouldn't do them, but they really have no relation to happiness. Making memes of your teacher, right? And then this, the worst chemistry project in history. And Mr. Patton's in the room, so I'm going to move to the next slide. Um, so, um, a lot of things bring joy that really do not have anything to do with happiness, right? So, uh, that was your point, Andrico. We can experience joy in really evil things. And, Raph, your point is, even if something's legitimate, you know, I like eating donuts, you just keep going back to the donut, and you never move past the donut. Okay? So St. Augustine uh, solves the problem, or St. Augustine makes this following distinction. Uh, long quote. Anybody feel like they want to read it? Pat? Uh, far be it from me, Lord, far be it from the servant making confession to you. 
Far be it from me that I consider myself happy, whatever, whatever be the joy in which I rejoice. For there is a joy which is not given to the wicked, whose joy is you yourself. And this is the happy life, to rejoice before you, about you, because of you. This is the happy life, and there is no other. Those who think that it is some other thing, follow some other joy, and not the true one. There will, however, is not averted from some sort of image of joy. Awesome. Very good, Pat. So, uh, any, just want to ask a few questions about that quote. So what do you think Augustine means when he talks about joy in the presence of concerning and caused by God? What do we think that means? Maybe, has anybody ever known joy in the presence of concerning or caused by God? Sometimes we go on a retreat, maybe Kairos, or, uh, or maybe, you know, maybe you go to Mass, and you, you just have this experience of God's love, right? You realize God loves you. Um, Augustine thinks that is the only true joy. Do we know why he says that? Do we think we know why he says that? Raf? It's the only thing that doesn't really cause harm. It's the only thing that doesn't really cause harm. It's the only thing that what? Lasts forever, right? Anything else? All right, yeah, it, it's, it lasts forever. That's the joy that lasts forever. That's the only joy that isn't going to get you stuck in some kind of rut, you know, that, that somehow lasts <laughs> off, or that somehow, you know, sort of spirals into sadness. Um, but can spiritual joys answer Mino's paradox? Can joy, that joy, that feeling of God loving you, can that allow anyone to seek for a happy life? What do we think? Why do you say yes, Anna? Um, can you come back to me? Sure. <laughs> well, it, yes in a way and no in a way. What do you have to have experienced? Uh, joy. Yeah, you, you, you have to have had that experience of knowing God's love. <laughs> right? I'm not saying I disagree with this. Sure. Like, how do we actually know that that is the true joy? Sure. Yeah. How do, you, how do you know that that's the true joy? Um, and before you've had that experience of God, well, then you can't seek for happiness according to this model, right? Um, so if we're going to solve Mino's paradox, we have to go to those false joys, that joy of eating a donut, and we somehow have to say how that can lead us to God. Do we see that? Okay, because until you've had that experience of God's love, you're kind of sunk. But we all have to seek a happy life, whether we've known God or whether we don't know God, right? Um, so, this is my thesis. It took me this long to get here, right? You know, your English teacher would not be happy. It takes you halfway through the presentation to get to the thesis. All right. So these ordinary non-spiritual joys can help solve the recognition problem, even if they ultimately prove false. Okay. And, and the, the example I give is uh, receiving a ring from a false lover. Let's say you're in this relationship, and it turns out that the person has been unfaithful to you. But that person, had before you figured out they were unfaithful, they treated you really well. So even though that joy ultimately proves false, it's going to help you see what the real thing looks like. In the same way, if, if any of you have ever had an experience of God, it's not completely unlike falling in love or riding a roller coaster or something like that. So even though these joys, or even being a kid in a candy store and, you know, oh my gosh, candy, right? Except you're, oh my gosh, God, you know, it's, it's different, but it's not so different that you're not like, okay, what is this God thing, right? It, it feels enough like an ordinary joy that we've experienced that we can recognize this as something we should pursue, Okay. But um, it is not enough to help solve the targeting problem. And, Raph, you, you talked about this. If, if, you, if you experience joy in eating a donut, you just keep eating donuts, right? You're not like, oh, I had a donut. I think I'll go thank God right now. You just keep, keep eating the donuts, right? 
And then even worse, um, we can experience joy in some things that become addictive, right? Um, and maybe uh, I'll give the example of a toxic relationship again. If you've got, uh, if you're in a relationship with someone and that person is not good for you, you will find some reason to stay in the relationship, right? There is something that is bringing you joy in that relationship that is going to blind you to the fact that it's not ultimately making you happy. Um, you know, and maybe addictive substances, too. Um, that um, if you have alcohol or, or drugs or that sort of thing, there's a joy that's there that can blind you to the fact that that is not ultimately going to bring you happiness. Okay? So we need something else in addition to joy if we're going to explain how we can target a search for happiness, even if those false joys can help us recognize happiness. All right. And so Augustine's answer to that is the desire for truth. Um, so, Nick, you want to read this quote? Sure. I've got a good voice. The desire for truth. I've encountered many people who want to deceive others, but no one who wants to be deceived. When has anyone known the happy life unless they have also known truth? For they also love the happy life when they do not want to be deceived. And when they love the happy life, which is nothing other than rejoicing in the truth, in every other way they also love truth. They would not love the truth unless they had some knowledge of it in their memory. Awesome. Very good. So, what Augustine's saying here, I think, is that people do not want to be deceived, right? Who here wants to be deceived? Nobody, right? Um, and that means that, it, to Augustine, you must have some knowledge. You must have some memory of being happy that you're right about something. Even if it's that memory of being in preschool and learning your ABCs and knowing them more than your little brother does and, you know, being right while your, your younger brother doesn't know it. But that desire is what sustains us. It's, what desire, it's the desire that causes detectives to want to find the answer to a case or a scientist to answer a problem, right? That memory of just being right is enough to propel us forward. But is it enough to propel us forward out of, say, a toxic relationship? Sometimes. 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 All right? And Augustine, Augustine is very realistic about um, human uh, fallibility and, and, and humans falling. Um, so he, he leaves room in his theory for the fact that sometimes this desire for truth is not enough. Um, so he says, truth, everywhere you preside over all who seek counsel of you, and at the same time you respond to all, even though they are seeking your counsel on different matters. Clearly you respond, but not all hear you clearly. Your best servant is not the one who thinks that he hears from you whatever he desires, but rather the one who takes care to desire whatever he hears from you. So there are two people. There are people who just kind of rationalize. There are people who say, well, I want to be right, so whatever I'm doing now is the happy life. And, you know, you can't tell me that this person's bad for me because, you know, you're just wrong and I'm right because I want to be right. Right? And then the other kind of people are the ones who are willing to acknowledge the truth of the situation, even when it's painful. And the, that knowledge of the truth kind of propels them forward. That desire for the truth, even if it's kind of painful to admit, is able to propel them forward from, from less authentic sources of joy to more authentic sources of joy. Make sense? All right. You've been great. Just a couple more slides. The last thing we've got to talk about. So we've talked about somebody who's migrating from something that's bad for them to something that's better for them. But Augustine says the only true happiness is found where? With God. With God, right? So how can this desire, this happy, being happy about knowing your ABCs lead you to God? You know, you're happy that you know 2 plus 2 equals 4. That makes you feel better than your little brother. But how does that lead you to want to go to heaven? It's a little hard, right? Um, so Augustine 
deals with the problem this way. First, he's got to show that being happy with 2 plus 2 equals 4 isn't enough to really make you happy. Uh, does somebody want to read the first quote? Anna again. Why, therefore, do they not rejoice in, in that memory of truth? Why are they not happy? Because they are rather distracted by other things, which makes them more miserable than that memory of the truth makes them happy, <laughs> which they remember only dimly. Awesome. So I can count two reasons why someone who knows 2 plus 2 equals 4 is still not happy. Can you see the two reasons? What, what's one? I think it's in this line. Because they're distracted by 2 plus 2. They're distracted by, you know, jeweling in the bathroom. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Distracted. You, you're not. You could be in math class. No, um, they're distracted by other things. ADD, right? Um, and then that makes them more miserable than that memory of truth makes them happy, which they remember only dimly. So their memory of two plus two equals four is not that strong. It's not enough to really make them happy. So then Augustine says, even if someone is wretched. He prefers to rejoice in true things over false things. He will therefore be happy if he rejoices solely in that truth by which all things are true, with no distraction interfering. So first, we have to have cooler truths than 2 plus 2 equals 4. We have to have, like, the ultimate truth in the universe. What's the ultimate truth in the universe? God, right? So we have to have this memory of God. And Augustine thinks when you pray you're given access to this ultimate truth. So when, when you go in front of the Blessed Sacrament and you're praying, you're experiencing the cause of every true thing, every true thing you, you ever knew or ever will know. The answer to every question on every test is somehow contained um, in, in what you're seeing in the Eucharist. Um, so when you pray, you see that ultimate truth. But what happens when you pray, when you go to adoration sometimes? You get distracted. Andrika. What would be like the definition of prayer or what is prayer Yeah, good question. So Augustine thinks whenever you think about God, God actually enters your memory. And you have this memory not of, you know, this thing or that thing, but of God, and you actually enter heaven whenever you pray, whenever you try to focus your attention just on God. It's strange to think about sometimes. Yeah, I, I agree because like some people they, they think that prayer is just like when you start the sign of the cross and then finish. Yeah. But you can find you prayer is so many other things. Yeah, I think what Augustine means is contemplative prayer. Where you're really able to not focus on anything else and just focus on God's love for you. And it's almost like you you have this feeling almost of being in heaven. Um and it's, sometimes it happens only rarely, but the more you pray, the, the more it kind of happens. Um, and Augustine thinks you can get that just from reading philosophy, too, just by thinking about the truth that makes everything else true, or the cause of, of everything that is. If you focus your attention on that, you actually do enter heaven for a brief moment. But then, like we said, you got to make dinner. you got to do your homework. You get distracted. Um, so... That's what causes us to desire this ultimate truth of heaven. So we've got 2 plus 2 equals 4. That makes us kind of happy. <coughs> then we want to have this ultimate source of truth that's going to make us more happy. But we're only really happy when we can always be in the presence of that ultimate source of truth. And that's what causes us to desire heaven. So what do we think? Have we solved the targeting problem? So we can go from jeweling to enjoying 2 plus 2 equals 4, from enjoying 2 plus 2 equals 4 to recognizing God, and then going from God to Happy. heaven. Happy. Um, Ultimate happiness in heaven. <coughs> so, Augustine has just resolved Mino's paradox without appealing to uh, reincarnation. Right? <coughs> He's not saying we have to be reincarnated in order to experience happiness.
or in order to know what happiness is. We have these memories of joy and truth that can allow us to seek out more authentic memories of joy and truth. We have these non-spiritual false joys that allow us to recognize the true spiritual joys when we, when we encounter them. And maybe not all of us have encountered them yet, but that's okay. We still enjoy eating donuts, and, you know, ultimately God will make you happier than a donut. Um, then we have truth. We enjoy being right. That can make us trick ourselves into rationalizing whatever situation we're in. But then we also acquire true beliefs, and those true beliefs can allow us to experience God as the ultimate uh, source of truth. All right. Any questions? Thank you so much. You are a great audience for people who are in the same <laughs> And for those of you who are in the same thank you so much. Hour long detention, so you can go home. <laughs> so we can go. Awesome. 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 Awesome.